Today's program, the annual Arnold Lecture, is in honor of Margaret Peg Arnold. Ms. Arnold was a resident of Wellesley for nearly 70 years. She came to town with her parents in 1924 and graduated from Syracuse University and earned her library science degree at Simmons College. She became head librarian for the Wellesley Free Library in 1950 and served for 31 years. Ms. Arnold was a town meeting member for many years, a director of the Wellesley <coughs> Human Relations Service, and music was another important part of her life. She played the oboe in the Wellesley Symphony, <laughs> Symphony Orchestra and the Wellesley College Orchestra. During her tenure as head librarian, Ms. Arnold guided the library from minimal quarters in Town Hall to the Coke Building across from Washington Street. <coughs> and upon her retirement, the Friends at the Wellesley Free Libraries established the Arnold Lecture Series. So uh, the Friends, again, appreciate your coming tonight. If you're not exactly familiar with what role the, the Friends play, think fish tank. Esme, do you like the fish tank here at the library? Who doesn't? So the Friends do things like keep the fish tank up, museum passes, if you've ever gone to a museum, thank the Friends. And if you have uh, come to a children's program, <laughs> then um, the Friends support many, but not all of the children's programs. Many, but not all of the grown-up programs, for example, uh, they'll have musicians come in this room or a variety of things. Sometimes we support a portion of the classic film festival that they do as well. But you can find out all of these things by becoming a friend. Um, would like to thank uh, Ben Coase for joining us tonight for so many reasons. First of all, he just um, very nicely made a little donation. So you guys are now friends, members of Lifetime Membership. So, <laughs> so wonderful. So we really appreciate the support. Uh, it's things like this that just make our year fun. So we are welcoming our own Wellesley Ben Coase as our speaker for tonight. Ben is a New York Times bestselling author of six international political and espionage thrillers. His novels include Power Down, Coup d'etat, The Last Refuge, mm -hmm. Eye for an Eye, Independence Day, and The First Strike. His seventh novel, Trap the Devil, will be published in June 2017. <coughs> Ben's books feature the main character, Dewey Andres. Am I pronouncing him correctly? Sometimes when you only read it, you forget that you all actually have to say it sometimes. So. <laughs> but, um, and uh, he's a beloved character by many, as I've seen for how many people stopped and talked to Ben about the, uh, their favorite books on the way in. So we are really looking forward to hearing from him. You can uh, also learn more about Ben at his website. And Wellesley Books is available if anybody wants to grab a book. There will be a signing after for people who have one. So again, without further ado, thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, thank you everyone for coming. Um, and uh, thank you, Susan. And thank you, friends of Wellesley Library, friends of mine, tennis, partners, neighbors, um, family, <laughs> undercover DEA agents, <laughs> deep cover embedded terrorists. Everyone, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, first of all, thank you, friends of Wellesley Free Library, for inviting me to deliver this year's Arnold Lecture. I wasn't sure who Arnold was, but I do feel confident he or she would be turning over in the grave if they knew you selected me. <laughs> Which is why I found her grave site and had it moved to an undisclosed location. <laughs> now, as many of you know, someone else was originally supposed to speak tonight and deliver the Arnold Lecture. Yes, that huge guy who gives out parking tickets near Starbucks <laughs> if you're so much as a nanosecond late getting back to your car. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here. <laughs> I know I speak for all of us when I say we're praying for a speedy recovery <laughs> from his two broken legs and the tire prints across his back. <laughs> bunch of friends here, so I, I try to keep it a little bit light. Just, you know. I want to begin by saying a few words in praise of libraries. In particular, I'd like to highlight the section and row where my books are located. <laughs> <laughs> 
everything else in here is quite frankly crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, grew, <laughs> I grew up going to the library in my hometown of West Simsbury, Connecticut. I love the library. It was an old mansion that someone had donated to the town and the bookshelves were scattered throughout the mansion's beautiful rooms. I learned to love reading there. I also fell madly in love with one of the librarians, Mrs. Bucky. <laughs> Even though I was seven years old and she was in her mid-thirties, married and had three children. I knew, we both knew, it could never work out. <laughs> A few years ago, when my mother finally moved from our childhood home in West Simsbury, we had to go move our stuff from the house. I drove down and packed up boxes and boxes of books from my childhood. I was frankly shocked at the large number of books that were stamped Simsbury Public Library <laughs> on the inside. <laughs> I know I should have felt guilty about not returning all those books, but then I realized they probably long ago forgot about them. Which is why I was surprised when I received a bill from the Simsbury Library for $679,422. Bottom line, return your library books. Now, as Susan mentioned, my seventh book, Trap the Devil, comes out in June. As with my six previous books, Trap the Devil is about current events and threats that face our country and you and me today. My books have run the gamut. Embedded terrorists, Iran in possession of a nuclear device, Russian computer hacking, Pakistan and India at war. Many people ask, how did you know that was going to happen? Well, as they say, some people just have a gift. <laughs> When I was nine years old, I predicted a former actor would be elected president of the United States. <laughs> yes, I predicted it would be Buddy Ebsen, <laughs> but the larger idea was spot on. <laughs> Several years ago, I predicted a gold medal winning Olympian would have a sex change. <laughs> and while I thought it would be Mike Ruzioni from the 1980 Olympic <laughs> hockey team, I again was largely correct in my prediction. <laughs> According to family legend, at age three, in 1969, I spelled out the word Watergate with my peas and mashed potatoes. <laughs> but back to the library. And what you should know is that a good percentage of Trap the Devil was written right here at the Wellesley Library. In fact, significant parts of all my books were written right here. Not by me, of course. <laughs> I usually just pay some teenager who's here doing their homework to write a chapter or two while I read old copies of Highlights Magazine or Car and Driver. <laughs> <laughs> One of the wonderful things about coming to the library, of course, is the access to information. After Tom Clancy wrote The Hunt for Red October, someone at the Pentagon accused him of leaking top-secret military information concerning submarines. Clancy's response was classic. Everything in the book I learned at the Baltimore Public Library is what he said. I think about that quote often as I work away here upstairs at one of the tables. What have I learned at the Wellesley Library? The short answer is more than I ever could have imagined. The sort of inside information that some might also consider top secret. I worked at the White House, but I now realize I actually knew little of the presidency and even less of American history. But thanks to the Wellesley Library, I can now take off the names of all 27 U.S. presidents. <laughs> I know everything there is to know about how Columbus defeated the British. <laughs> and I'm practically an expert on the war between the Indians and the dinosaurs in what is now Louisiana, a state Abraham Lincoln purchased from the Soviet Union in 1824. Yes, this library has given me a solid foundation of knowledge. 
All kidding aside, this beautiful library has been instrumental in my writing career. So thank you, staff, board, supporters, friends, for all you do. Earlier today, I was interviewed by a reporter from the Wall Street Journal. She was asking about competition amongst writers and whether I was worried because John Grisham has a book coming out around the same time as me this summer. Would it hurt my sales? I answered her as honestly as I could. John who? I said. <laughs> I then asked her if she knew of anyone who might be willing to rub out Mr. Grisham for a few hundred dollars. Actually, what I said was that writers don't compete with each other. We compete with television, computers, iPhones, and video games. We compete with Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and everything else making noise and invading our lives. Publishers, bookstores, libraries have all adapted to a new technology led world. The percentage of ebook sales continues to rise. My last book, First Strike, more than half of my sales were in ebook. That's adaptation. But it's not the same thing as competing. And the truth is, the competition, those forces I spoke of, are a powerful and I believe dangerous adversary. The challenge writers face is getting people to read. And unlike librarians and publishers who need to adapt to the ever-changing and complex world, and the complex way people access content, writers, it is my belief, don't need to adapt. In fact, adapting in itself is dangerous. Because what good writing is and what it has always been is storytelling. Making someone want to turn to the next page. Late at night, hours after they should have shut their eyes and gone to sleep. Great stories, compelling, relatable, real characters, authenticity, these have always and will always be the stuff of best-selling books and of library shelves. And so, in a very real way, libraries, publishers, bookstores are our truest partners, the truest partners of writers. Because you have adapted. You will continue to adapt or you'll disappear. I know I kid around too much, but I'm deadly serious when I say that I get a cool feeling, a chill, or maybe it's adrenaline every time I walk inside this building. Knowing my books are here and will be long and will be long after the parking ticket guy recovers and hunts me down like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> when my first book came out, Vince Flynn, who you may have all heard of, was the first person to stand up and tell his millions of readers about my book. Brad Thor, another author in my genre, read my second book and told everyone how much he liked it. Whenever I read a new author and I like what they've written, I tell my followers. The truth is, readers read. It's that simple. Readers read. Thriller readers read thrillers. And all of us, or most of us, understand this and help out other authors. When I recommend a book to my fans, I'm not cannibalizing my own sales. I'm actually doing something my readers appreciate, telling them about a new author or a great book. They might read it, but it doesn't mean they won't read mine. Many people have asked me how I finally started writing after spending a long career in finance. I did a lot of writing at Columbia when I was in college, and I was fortunate enough to be awarded Columbia's Writing Prize at graduation. Several of my professors told me to go out and become a novelist. Winning that award really made me think about dropping everything and trying to write the great American novel. But then, as they say, life got in the way. I was offered a job at the White House. And given the choice between waiting tables versus working at the center of power for the leader of the free world, I opted to head off to Washington and a job at the White House, which consisted mainly of answering phones. <laughs> And every day, as I walked into the White House, I said to myself, don't worry, Ben, you'll write that novel someday. After the White House, I had a series of interesting, sometimes lucrative jobs. I worked for 
Texas oil man T. Boone Pickens for the government of California and for Mitt Romney. I started a company and was a partner in a pair of private equity firms. I had some successes, some failures, but mostly a lot of fun. I made a lot of friends and I saw the world. Best of all, I met my wife and got married, then started having children. Actually, she's the one who had them, but I insisted on participating. <laughs> Sorry, Amy. <laughs> and all the while, in the back of my head, I kept hearing that reassuring voice telling me, don't worry, Ben, someday you'll write that book you were meant to write. The problem is, time was slipping away. That voice was growing fainter and fainter. Well, on my 40th birthday, as I was drifting off to sleep, I suddenly sat up, looked at my wife, and said, Shannon, for 20 years I've been saying to myself, I'm going to write a book, and look at me. I'm 40 years old, and I haven't written a damn thing. You look 25, she replied. <laughs> Someone as devilishly handsome as you shouldn't, shouldn't worry about anything. Just get over here and give me a kiss. <laughs> Actually, she didn't say that. <laughs> What she said was, get off your butt and start writing. The next day I woke up at 5 a.m. I tiptoed downstairs so as not to wake up the kids, gave the dog a pat, made some coffee, yelled at the neighbor, and then I sat down and wrote what would become the first sentence of my first novel, Power Down. In fact, what I wrote that morning became largely intact the first chapter of the book. I haven't missed a morning since, except today because I had to write this speech. <laughs> I guess my point is that everyone has a dream, and it doesn't always involve writing books. For some of you, it could mean you want to start your own business. Maybe you want to run a marathon. Maybe your dream is to climb Mount Everest or learn how to play the piano. Or maybe you too want to write the great American novel. What is that voice inside your heart asking you to do? Whatever it is, I'm here to tell you, listen to it, take a shot, and don't leave anything on the table. You might not succeed. You might not finish that marathon, or get your novel published, or you might not get to the top of Everest. But when it comes to dreams, the only way to fail is to not try. It's the attempt that matters, not the results. Finally, I would like to leave you with a quotation. This quote is from Amazon.com, <laughs> and it was written about my book, First Strike, by a reviewer who calls himself Zen Master 42. <laughs> Here's what Zen Master wrote. I love First Strike. Ben Coase's novel virtually explodes with brilliance, danger, and the sort of emotion that only great works of literature are capable of achieving. I couldn't put the book down, and even after finishing it, still can't put it down. <laughs> I will carry Mr. Coase's book around with me everywhere, a treasure to never be abandoned. <laughs> Quite simply, First Strike changed my life. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Zen Master 42 is actually me. <laughs> I wrote that glowing review as proof that when all else fails, you can always impersonate someone on the internet and write things to make yourself feel better. <laughs> friends of Wellesley Library, friends of mine, thank you for the honor of having me here tonight, and thank you for coming. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm. You know that, and we even have a microphone. If anybody in the back has a I think, question, I, I think I everyone can hear us. Here, so. Jared's asleep back there. <laughs> any. Well, 
That's a great question. She asked on the first morning when I sat down to write, how did I come up with that the character? And I so working and so the opening scene is on an oil rig, uh, which is where the whole series begins, and it's about a decade after the hero has basically been kicked out of the military and falsely accused of crimes he didn't commit. And he happens to work on an oil rig where that is the target of a terror attack. And so it kind of wakes him up. But I just had, honestly, I've been to a couple of offshore oil platforms and I just had this kind of image of a guy standing on an offshore oil platform at night with the flame stacks shooting off into the sky in the middle of nowhere. And that was all I had. I mean, I, I, I really didn't sit down to necessarily write a thriller. I just had this picture of this guy and, uh, and started writing. Sir. Sure. Anybody? So when you start a book, that first chapter, do you know where it's going? Like, first strike, did you know when you started writing it, have an outline like we used to have to do for compositions? No comment, nice question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, he, Vernon's a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, I used to not know where it was going. In fact, People when I... To repeat the question. Oh, oh. Um, the question is, when I start writing a book, do I know where it's going? And more so now than when I started. Um, and in fact, I get paid a bonus now for outlining because my publisher is, I think, believes that perhaps I veer off in these directions that I shouldn't <laughs> and it ends up taking... Uh, too much time to finish my books, so I get a bonus for outlining. Now, it's not a, a very organized structural outline, but it's basically, here's, what, here's where the story is going. So I outline now, and that forces me now to know roughly where it's going. When I started writing, you know, like Power Down, I really didn't know uh, where, where it was going. Um, and it's interesting because each one of my books about well, it's actually it's actually probably not that interesting, but I'll <laughs> tell you anyway. Each one of my books is about 125,000 words. So if you think about it, the measure of how efficient you are as a writer is how many words did you write total to finally end up at a book that comes out that's got 125,000 words. So first strike, I wrote around 160,000 words for to come to a hundred to 125,000 word book. So after editing and this and that, not just cutting, it wasn't it didn't start that long, but cutting, rewriting, stuff like that. Um, Power down. My first book was almost I spent almost 500,000 words writing that book. So um, and I. It, a lot of times it was because I didn't know where it was going. It, the, the challenge with outlining is the following. The, I, think, so I think the best scenes that I've ever written in terms of like action are ones where I'm like, I don't know where to go with this. Where I'm sitting there and you know, I don't know how, he's gonna, how these guys are going to escape from this particular situation. And I know if I feel that way when I'm writing it, that I'm going to write a scene that people are going to love. Because if I can't think of it, when they're reading it, they're really not going to be able to think of it. And so they're going to be hopefully blown away by that, that scene. And, and so the problem with outlining too much, I think, is that you can take away that spontaneity that is, at, I think, at the heart of a good thriller. So um, I try to you know, balance the two, not going into too much detail, going to enough to get the bonus. <laughs> <laughs>
but not going, you know, <laughs> too far into detail. So. So, I finished, it's a great question, and so I finished Power Down, the manuscript for Power Down, and I had a friend in publishing who was and still is very high up at Hachette, which is, owns Little Brown and a bunch of other publishing houses, and, and I had gone to high school with her, and she offered to put the manuscript in front of their top um, their top fiction editor, a woman named Reagan Arthur, who now has her own imprint. Um, but I didn't want that because I knew that even though I knew how to write, I knew I didn't know how to necessarily structure uh, a book properly, and so what I got from her was someone who's a freelance editor who read it and helped me to turn what was something that was very discombobulated. I mean, Jack, you can relate to this. I mean, he said that the garage was on the third floor, the kitchen was in the basement. You know, he used an architectural analogy. Um, so I fixed it, and then the thing that you have to do is number one, finish a manuscript, and then you have to get an agent, because a publisher will not read it if you don't have an agent. And I really think there's a, a big correlation between who your agent is and how easy it is that you your book sells and how much it sells for. And so obviously you want to try to get a great agent. And so what I did was I figured out who who are the agents for the best-selling authors in the thriller genre. And there's James Patterson, although he doesn't write his books. He, 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 he doesn't write any of his books. Someone else writes them, but he sells a ton of books. So he doesn't actually use an agent. He has a lawyer in Washington, the same guy who represents like the Obamas and Clinton and stuff like that. And so I called him, or I emailed him, and he wrote back and he said, it was like, Odds of getting an agent, one in, I don't know, like 8,000. Odds of getting published, one in 75,000. You know, he's like, good luck. <laughs> so, um, and by the way, when it came out, I sent him a copy. <laughs> I never heard back. Um, but then the two best-selling authors, really, if you put those guys aside, are David Baldacci and John Grisham. Put it, putting aside certain kind of anomalies like, you know, Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code, or like J.K. Rowling. But, um, and so I found out who their agents were, and I went through the process of trying to get an agent. And it's a long process because you can't really do, at least I felt I couldn't do it all at once, like send it to a bunch of people. Um, I felt I had to do it one at a time and then, or just a couple at a time. And, but... The way agencies work is it's it's very much a meritocracy. They are the scouts for the publishing house. They only get paid if you get paid. And they get a certain percentage of every dollar you make. And it's it works very well, but the way the firms are typically set up is a young reader freshly out of college will read that first couple chapters you send. And if he or she likes it, they'll ask for more. And if they like it, they'll ask for the whole thing. And then if they like it, they'll recommend it to a junior agent, and if they like it, they'll recommend it to the, you know, to the whole firm. And because most firms, except some of the really big ones, you have to, um, you know, it has to be kind of unanimous. People want to, uh, everyone at the firm wants to, wants to be on board. And so it's a long process, and it works though because if you think about it as an author, you, you've got to appeal to different audiences. So you're appealing to that 22-year-old kid 
the junior agent, and they're all staking their reputations on it. So anyway, it probably took eight months to get an agent, and at the end of the day, both Grisham and Baldacci's agent, agents um, wanted to sign me. And, but I went with David Baldacci's agent, a guy named Aaron Priest, and a woman named uh, Nicole James, because I just felt like they had more energy. And, 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 you know, because once you're a big agent for an author like Baldacci or Grisham, you're getting a certain percent, it doesn't matter, you know, your work is done, you're getting, you're just cashing checks. Um, and because every time their book comes out, they're, you're making a ton of money. Whereas I, I really felt, and I still feel like Aaron, Nicole were just hungry, really hungry. So I went with them. So that probably took six, seven, eight months. And I'll never forget cause I was waiting to hear and I was out, I was playing golf in Palm Desert. And I was like on the golf cart when the phone rang and it was like Nicole and Aaron calling to ask if I would join their agency and I felt like I was like an entourage or something. <laughs> I'm like, uh, sure. <laughs> um, so then after that, they had certain edits they wanted me to make and then once they went out, they go out to auction, there's a limited number of big publishers, but within four days, five days, there were multiple offers for the book. So it's like, it took eight months, and a lot of people never even get an agent, but it took eight months for me to get an agent, and it took like four days to have a bunch of offers, which kind of shows the importance of, of having an agent, and especially having a, a really good agent. That first one, that freelance editor who helped me changed a lot of it structurally, not necessarily the writing, but um, so I wrote, so that first scene that I talked about writing, when I finished my main, of the guy standing on the oil platform, when I finished the overall manuscript, I had moved that and put it into the book. And so the, his first comment was, Ben, I, I really like, this is the freelance editor, he's like, I, I like the book, um, but, you know, I, I, Dewey's obviously your hero. I think maybe, it, you know, the first time he appears in the book is on page 180. I think maybe we should move him a little <laughs> earlier. <laughs> so I didn't know what I was doing structurally. So, so and then, um, and then my agent, well, the biggest thing my agent, Aaron, wanted in my first book, there's this guy who's like an older, he's a CEO, but he's really cool, named Teddy Marks, and he's the CEO of this oil company, and he get, and in the first draft, he gets killed in Aspen, and in this just brutal fight, and that's probably a third of the way through the book. Well, my Aaron Priest, my agent, was like, listen, Everything's great except for one thing. This guy, Marx, is awesome. You got to keep him alive. <laughs> so it's like he's dead a third of the way through the book. But once you bring him back as a major character, if you think about it, it's got to flow in, and through the rest of the book, and it, it, and he's got to have impact on, you know, every scene he's involved with in the larger plot. So that was, that one was awful. And then, <laughs> and then. I went with, you know, we went with St. Martin's and the editor there, who's still my editor, he was Robert Lovelam's editor, a guy named Keith Kayla. He had a bunch of changes. You know, he was like, I love the, I mean, they, they, you know, they paid to, you know, for the first two or three books. And so they obviously believed in me, but he was like, you know, I really love the first 60% of it and the last 40% I like but I want to love it, and I'm not sure why. And so the edits, my first editorial letter from Keith on Power Down was 28 pages long, single spaced. There was like a page of like basically 
blowing smoke up my keister saying, oh, I love you, you know. Then the rest of it was just, it was probably 20 pages of very detailed edits, but not like spelling and, and grammar. It's kind of like, all right, page 210, this particular scene on the stairwell takes one paragraph. Your reader wants a page. You know, it's like, so 20 pages of that. And that was the easy part because the last eight pages or less, six pages, whatever, was basically like this dissertation on what he thought was wrong with the last 40%. He couldn't quite put a, his finger on it, but it had to do with plot, character, stuff like that. And so, and they've gotten better as I've learned how to, I think, write better books, but they're still really, really hard. And, and I would say, I'm trying to think of Trap the Devil. First Strike, it t I mean, it typically takes me longer to do the edits than it does to write the book. So, and there's nothing grammatical. It's all structural. It's, it, it would be as if a, you wrote a dissertation and your professor is writing a detailed critique of it. That's kind of what, um, what it's like with, at least with my editor. And I have a lot of friends in the genre and I'm the only one who has an editor like this. I mean, I've got a friend who writes, he writes the Clancy books and he also has his own series, this guy named Mark Greeny, who's a New York Times bestseller. And Mark's editor, literally, it's always like less than a page. He always sends it to me because it's like <laughs> paragraph. And he's like, oh, on page 317, there's a typo. Like the guy, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And, but my editor is just a, he's brutal. But, you know, I really think, um, I learned how to be edited. It's one of my, I think, biggest assets as a writer is knowing how to, and appreciating being edited. A lot of, I think, writers take it personally. And I actually look at it as the opposite. And I learned this as a White House speech writer, which is you, an editor's going to make it better and you're going to get the credit. And so I learned how to be edited and I think it's one of my, my biggest assets. So Keith has really helped, I think, um, improve the quality of my books. And, and so I like being edited, even though it's just a lot of work. You, yeah, and we've talked about that. It, it was, you, you, you just mentioned, uh, so you just mentioned you know, so and so writes for Tom, Clan writes Tom Clancy's books. Just explain how that, you, you explained it to us one time. Right? Oh, yeah. It's very interesting how some of these big time authors really don't write a lot of their books. Or any of the books here. Right. Yeah. Tom Clancy's deceased, isn't he? He is. Yeah. <laughs> he is. Yeah, his, they've gotten a little dull <laughs> since he died. Uh, <laughs> very short and very dull. <laughs> no, uh, so, I mean, I think, to me, it, it, I would never let someone, I would never like write a book and let someone else put their, their name on it. And I, and I also would never put my name in a book that someone else wrote. How many people do that? Unless they paid us, you know, <laughs> it's like some dollar amount there. I mean, so Tom Clancy's deal, because I had the same film agent as him and and actually I know it because they approach me after power down they typically approach someone who's like a first time second time book but it's like a bestseller but and thriller and they the deal is basically all right we'll pay you half a million bucks to write the next Clancy book it'll say Tom Clancy and it'll say with Ben Coase or with Matt Maley and then and then what, but what Clancy, and you write the entire thing, what Clancy gets is between, depending on things like video game rights and other factors, between 10 million and 15 million dollars. Plus, he gets the upside, meaning once the books sell through, once you sell enough books where you've paid back that advance, um, he gets royalties forever. 
So, in my opinion, it's, you know, it. I, for, I would never do it. The only condition I would probably, I would have done it at that point under, would be like if, if your name was just as big and you split the money right down the middle. Um, because you're doing all the work. And, and in fact, it was interesting because Tom was alive at this point and he not only didn't write any of the books after a certain book, he didn't even read any of them. You know, James Patterson's another one. He doesn't write anything. Um, I think it's perfectly acceptable and in fact cool that, you know, after someone dies, you continue the the series with a ghostwriter, or, or not even a ghostwriter, someone whose name is on the book. So Vince Flynn, you know, tragically passed away at 47 a few years ago of cancer, and they've come out with, I think, three books, and it says Vince Flynn by so-and-so, Kyle Mills, who I, who's a friend of mine, and I think that's perfectly acceptable, because the readers want to read about that, that hero. But when they're alive, it's, to me, it's, a, it's kind of um, BS, but that's basically how it works. They pay someone who is either a really young, kind of ingenue writer who hasn't um, maybe cracked the New York Times yet or whatever, really needs the money, um, and they get them to write it and they stamp, they stamp you know, Clive Cussler does it too and then they stamp the name on it. They, they take all the upside and most of the money. But, um, you know, 500,000 bucks is a lot of money. And, you know, my buddy Mark, who's written probably half a dozen Clancy books, is, you know, he doesn't regret it because he really did need the money. Now his, his own series has started to sell really well, so he doesn't really need to do it anymore, and he's not going to do it. So that's basically how it works. Robert Parker, who, you know, write, wrote just wonderful kind of mysteries, noir mysteries, who lived over in Cambridge, you know, he's deceased as well, and, uh, um, you know, he's had at least half a dozen books come out with with different people writing them, and they're, and they're good, you know. Uh, so I think there's nothing wrong. In fact, I think it's kind of cool when someone dies and, and there's and they carry it on for the readers and they do well um, when they're alive I think it's a little strange so do you ever uh, write your characters into, a, into trouble on purpose without knowing how any idea how, how you know get them out of it absolutely <laughs> and all the time can you talk about one instance where that happened and how you figured it out well in the book that's about to come out um, what's that? No spoilers. Oh no, it's um, Dewey stubs his toe and he really hurts, <laughs> and he's trying to get a band aid. But the, no, um, these he's in Paris and the secretary he's with the Secretary of State, who's assassinated, and Dewey's basically set up for the murder and he's taken into a what's called a terror intake unit in Paris which is a highly secure facility where they take kind of first stage um, suspected terrorists and um, and so and it he had to be caught and, and put there. So I was basically like, how the hell is he going to get out of here? And so that's a, that's a good example. I had no idea um, how he was going to, how he was going to get out of there. Um, so fortunately that's when Luke Skywalker comes in <laughs> and saves him and Chewbacca and Han Solo. So a little cross genre stuff going on. No, I, I do that all the time. So, so he's in this terror intake unit. How is he going to get out of there? And I'm always like, Shannon, I, I'm just in this, I can't believe I did this again. I put myself in this situation. I have no idea, you know, because I want to be authentic too. Um, I don't want to just be like, oh, he magically came up with a way out. You know, it's it's got to be 
maybe not real, but as close to real as, as can be. So I, yeah, I do that all the time. And I think, again, I think, I actually think it's always a better scene if I don't know how he's getting out of something or how someone's getting out of something than if I do going into it. Because if I don't know, then I'm gonna either write a scene that's really clever and really fun for the reader or it's gonna get cut. Or I'm not gonna, or I'm not gonna figure it out. If that makes sense. So. Uh, well, first, I'm really angry that you killed off Jessica Tanzi in the early novels of Jack. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm too. Yeah. <laughs> really um, but, but actually, have you, the serious question is, uh, have you, have you been approached by authorities pretty regularly? Because you have so many insights the way Clancy was. Have you been peppered by any of these guys? You seem to have so much specific information. Just that traffic guy in, in, in <laughs> Starbucks, you know. Um, and I can tell by the way he writes the tickets that he's wondering about certain information that I might, may or may not have. <laughs> um, a couple times I've been called, um, a couple times my publisher's been called, and um, and I do have sources that are, you know, within certain agencies. I have a couple of sources, for example, at the NSA. But whenever I have a source, I don't have a source who's ever told me something that, you know, they could get, I think, locked up for. Because what I'm looking for is not like nonfiction information that maybe should be on the front of the Washington Post, like they did such and such to such a person. What I'm looking for are, are, is information about how things actually work. What, you know, what some of the technology is and how it works versus we know a certain country is this way. And I don't put my sources into that position, A. And B, I always say you can read what I've written um, before you know, before it, it, I send it to my publisher um, to make sure that I'm not gonna inadvertently get them in trouble, like I did that first guy who's now in Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, he was a good source. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so I, but I. You know, and, and the calls have never been threatening in nature. Um, and, you know, I, so I wouldn't, I'm not sure I'm really on, you know, I, well, I mean, they do, so the CIA has a department where all, really all they do is read. If you've seen like Three Days of the Condor, it's kind of like that. They read thrillers um, and it's, you know, so, but they, you know, the, my sense, and I'm not, I don't work there, so I don't know, but my sense is that they are overwhelmed with a lot of stuff that's going on in the current world. I mean, the biggest thing is not so much the data and the information they're getting, but how to process it. And there's so much data coming in. The technology is ahead of the ability to parse it and analyze it. And so my sense is that they are not looking, that they're spread thin and looking at much bigger stuff than is, has some author, you know, written something that is, you know, potentially uh, classified. Um, it, it, the one time that it, there was one time that legal action was threatened, but not by the government. Um, it was by a hedge fund. So when Power Down was about to come out, the galleys, you know, you, you print galleys a few months before you come out and you send them out to reviewers and hopefully they read it and review it and, and bookstores. And so the galleys were not out. So very few people had the book. And the terrorist in that book, if any of you have read it, is a guy named Alexander Fortuna, and he works at a hedge fund. And 
there's a brief thing at one point where it's mentioned that he used to work at Appaloosa, which is a a hedge fund in New York that's you know medium sized, um, and and he left there and had his own has his own hedge fund. And when he was there, he made a billion before he was thirty. And one of the big trades he did was he shorted General Motors, um, and he bet that it was going to go down. So that was just like a throwaway. And I and I honestly I put. My brother works at a hedge fund, but I just put Appaloosa in there because I, I thought, I think it's a cool name for a hedge fund, right? So, so then I get a call from my editor saying, hey, we need to, we need to talk, and um, I've got the general counsel for, there's St. Martin's, and then there's um, all of Macmillan, which is this big kind of conglomerate of publishing houses, which is my publisher, and... So that the lawyer for Appaloosa had called and said, we understand that you've got a book coming out um, from this guy, Ben Coase, that mentions Appaloosa, and, um, and it's got to be out of there. And, it, and, and so it turns out Appaloosa, so, and the terrorist in the book, coincidentally, is from Lebanon. Well, Appaloosa had had a trader there, one of the investors at Appaloosa, whose initials were AF. He was from Lebanon. He was French, but he was from Lebanon. And he had made a bunch of money shorting Chrysler. <laughs> Just pure coincidence. So they wanted me to change the name of Appaloosa, obviously. And so I was like, well, why... I mean, think of all the publicity, you know? And at the time, like, Appaloosa had probably $15 billion under management, right? So I was on the call with my editor and the general counsel from, from Macmillan. And I was like, think of the publicity. I mean, it'd probably be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. You know, big Appaloosa is trying to squash this book. It'll be, it'll drive sales up. And so the general counsel's like, he's like, all right, let me, let me just say for the sake of argument, I agree with you. And instead of, it being a front page story, let's say it's a front page story for a week or a month, and it's on every TV channel. I'm like, yeah, exactly. He's like, yeah, okay. And he's like, do you think that that is more, what do you say? He said, well, is that worth $15 billion of marketing? Because basically, because that's how much they had to spend to basically crush us. <laughs> He was basically saying it doesn't matter how much publicity because Appaloosa can crush anyone they want to. So that was the only time that it's really where there's ever been kind of a legal legal threat. So needless to say, I changed the name. So. Yeah. <laughs> my tennis partners, um, their wives. Um, so, well, I mean, of, of course, my family inspires me, um, and and is the anchor for everything in the compass of my life. I think, in terms of my books, there's no question that everything just comes out of what. I see going around and the threats that I see that were that we face, and so I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's why I write because I see threats, problems, and I mean it. It, it is the one area where when I do talk to people who are in or just out of government, or and I I do ask, you know what. What do you guys, you know, what's the big, what are the top three worries you guys have right now? Um, and so, um, you know, that's, in fact, that's how my second book, which is really about Pakistan and India, came about from, from a conversation I had with someone. But, so, I'm not inspired in the sense that 
you know, it's like I see a rainbow out in the, you know, over the stream and go prancing over in my, my clown shoes. And <laughs> but um, if inspiration means what, you know, gets me fired up, it's just looking around and seeing how screwed up some things are and the threats that we face. And then also what I see is the resolve of individuals, which I try to portray through my, through my heroes, if that makes sense. Um, I think right when I was talking to that reporter today, I was, she was asking what, like how I write and, um, the thing about writing. And I think the thing about anybody who's going to write that I learned really early is that you have to look at it almost like a blue collar job where it's like laying bricks and you can't in fact rely on inspiration if you want to write a book a year or two books a year because inspiration is fleeting and it comes and goes but bricklayers need to go out and lay bricks if they want to make money and feed their family, right? And so the way I look at writing is that I've got to write a certain amount every day. And sometimes I don't do it. And then I feel like, you know, I feel badly, but I want to write five pages a day, double spaced. And if you do that, then you're going to write a lot, whether you're inspired or not. And I think that's definitely the thing that separates would-be writers from writers is is that and every every writer who puts out a book a year um, David Baldacci puts out two a year that's the approach they take is inspiration or not I'm gonna write whether I feel like it or not and uh, sometimes it's really hard so, and sometimes it's easy and you're inspired and then you write something that ends up being lousy and sometimes you're not inspired, but you get up and you start writing and write and write and write. There's one day in Maine, a couple of summers ago, and I wrote, I literally wrote 42 pages one day. And Shannon deleted it. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I would have won the Pulitzer for it. <laughs> Just that one brief section, but oh well. Um, when the check gets wired into my, <laughs> the, you know, um, well, actually, you know, it, the moment I feel like when I'm done is when I'm fin when I finish the first draft and turn that in, even though I know I've got a bunch of editing and I just, you know, you know, it cause you write the last scene and, um, this is going to sound kind of hokey, but I would say of my seven books, there's probably three, four times where I finish and I literally start like crying and I go to Shannon and tell her like I finished. And, um, and she tells me to, to act like a man. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> no, she doesn't. No, but I, so, you know, I think to me that's more of a moment than when they, there's like, there's this final sign off when you get acceptance, you know, when you get an advance, it's divided into four chunks. When you sign the contract, when they accept the draft that's going to be published, when the hardcover comes out, and then when the paperback comes out, and then you get royalties for every book sale. So. Um, I think a lot of writers say when it's when you get when the when the draft is accepted, but you know, for me, the moment is really when you I just finish the draft wherever I am and I'm done. You know, I've written that final scene. It's a, and it's a good feeling. It's a it's a great feeling. So yes, sir. Thank you. I think you should, but I wouldn't read them. 
I wouldn't read the library copies, though. <laughs> the ones from the bookstore are much... Each one contains bonus material. Um, and you never know who's been reading it. It's at the library, you know? So I would definitely pick a few up. No, I'm sorry. I keep... <laughs> Yeah. They've all been in audio. And of the six that have come out, five of them have all been a guy named Peter Herman, who's on Law and Order. And he's, he's excellent. And he wasn't available for the second one, coup d'etat. And so there was someone else who was used, and it was, I mean, he was good, but Peter's, you know, really, really good. I mean, audio, and I love the audio, even though, I mean, audio is not a huge component of, of anyone's book sales, but um, it's fun to listen to when the audio comes out, and typically my, you know, books start coming, I'll, I'll get it early in the summer, one of the copies of it before it, it uh, hits the bookstores and we go up to Maine and I'll, I'll just put it on, driving up and driving back. And it's kind of like, I guess it must be, an, a, you know, microcosm, I guess, not quite as good as seeing something on TV or like a play that you wrote. It's, it's, it's kind of different when you hear it. And Peter Herman is excellent. And they've, They've, a number of them have won different like audio awards, mainly because his voice is, you know, he's really, really good. I found out today that he is, cannot do Trap the Devil, which is like a huge bummer. Um, so they've got a guy named, oh, thank you. They've got a guy named, oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Um, no, they've got a guy who does James Patterson stuff, but he's not, I, don't, I haven't heard him, but no one's as good as, uh, as Peter, but Peter's got, he was married to Mariska Hardigay, have you heard of her? Like, and they've got something going on, and they're going to be basically out of the country for a stretch of time, and he can't do it, so. But I love the audiobooks. If you haven't listened to them, they're awesome. Peter, because of Peter, I mean, I mean, the books are not bad, but the <laughs> Peter's also great. They're really fun to listen to. Yes, there's, there's, I mean, there is. Technically, it's, they're in development, um, but the whole relationship with Hollywood is complicated, and I feel like I've been up and down the Hollywood hills, this will be the third or fourth time, where you're moving forward and then something changes. Um, at one point we were, these two guys who were kind of Dick Wolf, you know the guy from, actually from Law & Order, um, they were... I would like to see a TV series done. I've been offered options to do movies, and I haven't wanted to do that because I just think a lot of the talent has, is going to TV, and I also think 12 or 13 episodes would be a, a much better way to, to take my books versus like 90 minutes and just compressing it. So I've pushed for that. Um, we were kind of working with HBO, Dick Wolf, Dick Wolf, and his two like top guys who um, who just happened to really like my books. And then, but they were also doing Chicago Fire, and, and the pilot had just come out, and the, like they had bargained for, they had been paid for like three episodes. So, and they were like, look. 
NBC is not picking this up. The the ratings are horrible, and they showed me like they were, they were like it's it's just not going to happen. So, and they had been talking to HBO at that point about distribution and and stuff like that, and and then NBC picked it up, and now those guys are like these guys are like mid thirties and now. Um, Derek Haas, and now they are the showrunners, executive producers, and they own a piece of Chicago Fire, Chicago PD, Chicago, you know, all the Chicago things, and they're, you know. Um, I'm actually, I was never a big fan of Dick Wolf, so that, in a way, um, didn't bum me out too much. And, but, you know, I have no idea. There, you know, all I know is there's a lot of content out there, and there are not a lot of uh, slots for the channels for that content. There are a lot of thrillers that come out every year. Vince Flynn has never had anything made. Brad Thor has never had anything made. Daniel Silva has never had anything made. Um, John Grisham has never had anything made. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, Ian Fleming has never had anything made. Um, <laughs> No, but uh, but the guy who's behind it now is a producer who I really like a lot. His name is Lorenzo de Bonaventura, um, and he's a big producer. And he came to it because of he read the books, and he, you know, he loves he generally really you know loves the books. And so um, my hope is that something will happen um, in terms of uh, a show, you know, it going from being in development to where they start really putting money behind it. Um, they're putting some time, some, I guess, money behind it, but when they start to actually um, do it and write the script. And I, if I had to predict, I would... You know, I would say there's like a zero percent chance because I just know I've been down this road with Hollywood so many times, and the people out there are just. It, I mean, it's. I'm not saying they're like they're all dishonest, but it's almost like it's structural in nature. It's like part of their culture, and so you can be at a meeting where someone is like, "Hey, listen, I really think this person would be great for that," and then we'll do this, and then. An hour later, they'll be in another meeting and they'll say something completely different. Uh, or like a week later, they'll say something, and then you're like, wait, I thought you said that. And, and they're, they're almost like, you, you believe me? <laughs> you know, it's like, like everyone, it's part of the culture out there to just take meetings and kind of like tell the person you're meeting with what they want to hear and then move on. And then somehow, you know, and I... Trust me, I don't know yet. Somehow, occasionally things fall down through the funnel and get made, you know. But I'm hopeful. I think it would be a great TV series on, you know, on HBO or, or uh, you know, um, Cinemax or Showtime, something like that, um, right in the vein of Homeland. I think it would be better than Homeland, um, which I think is a great show. Um, so we'll see what we'll see what happens. Um, by the way, I've got to tell you something. Have, has anyone here, other than my wife and my daughter, a little bit watched? There's a six episode. It's not Showtime, but it's called The Night Manager. It was made um, off of a John Le Carre book. If you haven't seen that on Showtime, you've got to watch it. It is so. Good. It's one of the best things I've seen in years. Did you agree, yeah. sir? <laughs> Homeless man in the fourth row. <laughs> the food's over there, sir. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's he's a buddy of mine. Um, <laughs> so, um, are there? <laughs> on that note, now are there? Are there any other? Personal journal. No. No. I just have one last question. He's afraid to ask it. Where do you where do you come up with the names of some of your characters? (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, I will say, well, there are a lot of people who, who have, uh, friend, I mean, one of the challenges is like you're always coming up with new characters, especially in a kind of a convoluted, multilateral um, thriller. And it's funny because I've donated that to a few like charities and people like bid on the right to be in it. And I'm, I tell you, I spend an inordinate amount of time trying to think of names to come up with. So I, I will throw friends in there quite often. Richard Baum right here was the chairman of the Fed. <laughs> um, of course, he drove the country into a near economic rebellion. <laughs> Matt, I think, Matt, I, th I think you were a parach uh, paratrooper, but I think you got blown up. <laughs> Jack Sullivan was, uh, that was a sweet character. I should have put that in before you renovated our house. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't have so many leaks now. <laughs> So, um, any... I need a bigger part if this goes to the movie. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm bringing you back in. Yeah, so, and Vernon's got, you got a good name. Dave, if I put you in... It, it's funny because when I have given them away, or they, you know, like, donated it, and every, or I have a contest, I always say to the person who wins... Um, do you want to be a good guy or a bad guy? And 100% of the people, and it's probably been 10 people by now, 100% say bad. <laughs> they want to be bad. So, it's, um, I'm like, okay. You're probably going to die. <laughs> There's this guy who comes to all the thrillers, there are these big conferences, he's, um, there's one, a couple every year, um, that is for the whole thriller world, and they're like, you know, it's like tens of thousands of people there, and, and you're on panels, and, but there's this one guy who has been, his whole goal is to get killed off by everyone, so I killed him off in one of my books, um, and, uh, he has been killed off by, like, Vince Flynn killed him off, Brad Thor killed him off, <laughs> Stephen King killed him off, Lee Child killed him off. He's got like a stack of books where he's been killed. Because that's his whole goal. Um, and he carries around a card. He's retired. He's a banker in Chicago. But he carries around a card that says something like Michael Dillman. And it says, um, I don't know, something like dead man or like <laughs> recently killed off. Anyway, this is kind of funny. So, um, any other? Well, you're a freelance editor, one and done. That person did a very good job. And you want had to go back. That's right. He's, uh, we've stayed in touch. He's a, he's, he's a, um, really very nice guy. And I've actually, turn people, I get a lot of people who send stuff and want, you know, will I read it? And the, and the thing is, I'm not a, number one, I don't have the time, but number two, I'm not an editor. I'm not a, a necessarily a talent uh, hunter. Um, and so I always send them to Ed, his name's Ed Stackler. And um, he, he primarily works with, have you heard of Greg Isles? He's a big New York Times, number one. Great books, kind of noir, southern um, books. He, Natchez Burning, um, really, really, really good writer. Just wonderful books, really kind of. Um, but yeah, I just, I worked with him that one time and, and uh, he, he, was, he was instrumental. So, um, in fact, he helped me get my agent um, because Greg Isles is also represented by the, the same agent, so, um, so, well, everyone, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And I, and I, and I will say that I, 
Why? I know we had to lock the doors, and there was that big crowd out there trying to get in. I'm not sure why, but uh, no. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and good seeing so many of you that who. Susan, I haven't seen you in so long, and and or no, I have, I guess, but good seeing you guys and every all the new faces. Thank you for coming. Great, we appreciate it. I hope uh, everybody will enjoy the book coming out soon. There are some cookies that need to be eaten. If anybody needs fortification on the way home, I'm not just looking at you, but you know it is there, and. Um, <laughs> Then we'll be able to sign some things if anybody has a book.